So Veronica, talking about economic repercussions, let's talk about how large those repercussions could be in the U.S. in particular. We have Deutsche Bank now, the first big bank, out with a warning that the U.S. economy will fall into a recession in 2023. Where do you put the odds? Yeah, I think it is important to remember, though, that you know near-term growth is, is still really strong. Um, if I had to put a, a number to it, I'd say, you know, 25% for the next year. It certainly gets gets higher as we're getting into late 2023, though, and especially 2024. Um, you mean the near-term, you know, direct impacts from, you know, geopolitical issues. You know, the main issue is just higher gas prices, which can weigh on growth. Um, but usually, you know, we, we kind of think as the U.S. economy is kind of hedged to, to higher oil now that we're, we're such a much larger producer. Veronica, I keep hearing that the U.S. consumer has lots of money saved up from the pandemic, that the balance sheet is strong for the consumer as a result of which they can weather this storm. Then I look at some of the consumer data and consumer data is rolling over pretty quickly. How do I put those two things together? Yeah, it's true. If we if we look at the last two years of, of savings data, and that's just the difference between incomes and consumption, there's about two trillion you know, an excess savings that's been accumulated. Now that won't account for anyone paying down debts or it won't account for, you know, housing, people buying homes over the last year. And of course the real spending power of, of that is pretty limited probably at this point. Um, and we are seeing, you know, growth slowing in retail sales, for instance, but partly this is just a, you know, shifting from demand from goods back towards services you know, as, as more people go out and spend on services again. Mm. I would say that the, the strong labor market, though, even if, if real wages are, are falling in, in negative, you know, negative terms, um, positive, you know, nominal income growth is, is still really high and can support consumption for, for a bit here. So you view it more as shifting demand rather than demand destruction? I think that's a little bit of what's going on right now. Yeah, I would say, especially on, on that goods back towards services side. Um, as we're getting into to later in the year, though, there's definitely the, the possibility that you know, high inflation just starts to bite more across all types of, of goods and services. Of course, we're, we're seeing that inflation in all, in all components of, of CPI. But in all of this, are consumers trading down? Are, are they buying less expensive goods, less expensive services? I'm, just, I'm, I'm looking forward to the earnings season. I'm trying to understand what companies are going to be seeing right now. Consumers, obviously a huge part of that equation. What do you think consumer behavior is going to be delivering in terms of the value of goods that are being purchased, the types of goods that are being purchased? How changeable is consumer behavior right now? Yeah, it's a great question. And we don't really have great insight in the aggregate data on, on that type of behavior. You know, if people are buying the, the cheaper option versus the, the more expensive one. Um, I would say, though, that, you know, the normal you know, parts of, of consumption that we would see as more discretionary, something like or travel or, or recreation, um, we can actually see a lot more strength in there, you know, just over the summer as, as people are going on vacation again, um, you know, they might be, you know, less, less sensitive to, to price increases if you haven't had a vacation in two years. All right, Veronica, obviously you're at Citigroup Global Markets. You work with Andrew Hollenhorst, who was out with that monster call for four consecutive 50 basis point rate hikes from the Federal Reserve. That's on the hiking side. I'm wondering how you view the balance sheet within that and what you're going to be looking for in the meetings that are going to cross a little, uh, the minutes from the meeting that will cross about three hours and 15 minutes from now. Yeah, yeah, we should hopefully get a lot more detail in, in the minutes from that March meeting. Our base case is that they announced balance sheet runoff at the next meeting in May, um, even alongside a, a 50 basis point hike. Um, and then balance sheet runoff starts in June. Um, the start of it should look pretty familiar, you know, ramping up the caps, uh, you know, faster than last time, though, and larger caps, you know, that's allowed to run off. So we're expecting 75 billion monthly cap reached by around August. Um, you know, the, they could be more active on the on the balance sheet, though, this time, of course. Um, I wouldn't necessarily expect, you know, sales or anything in, in the near term. Um, and we, we're not sure if the minutes will, will mention that or not. Um, we'll, we'll be watching for that. But that is the type of you know, more active tool that they could use down the line yeah. if they, they need. Veronica, what are you guys thinking about in terms of the translation from QT into basis points? What is this QT going to mean in additional tightening? We can all think in basis points. So what is it going to look like? A and do we need to think about QT working alongside tightening in terms of interest rates or does it compensate for, i.e., if we see faster and more active QT, does that reduce the need for, for more interest rate hikes? Yeah, that's a, a really important question because if we, if we go back to the last you know, QT cycle, 
um, there was this sense that balance sheet would just run in the background um, and the, the primary tool, of course, would be would be rate hikes. And I think that's still true. Um, you know, the Fed will still use you know, the, the policy rate as, as their main tool. Um, I would say, I mean, it's really hard to put a basis point number to, to QT. Um, I would say, you know, we maybe see, you know, the comments from Brainerd yesterday, and maybe that's what got back end yields selling off a bit more. It was more balance sheet focused. So maybe there's some signaling aspect to it, but it's, it's really hard to put a, a basis point number to it. And Veronica, in all of its action, the Fed always says it's going to be data dependent. What parts of the data matter at this point? <laughs> Yeah, yeah, we're we're also data dependent, of course. Um, we do have that call for the next four meetings, 50 basis point hikes, and really the data that yeah. we're expecting to see is is high inflation, um, and that's what the Fed is going to be watching most. Also, just the the next you know couple CPI prints, really not seeing okay. any signs of what's going to push inflation down on its own. We just have really tight labor markets and broad based inflation. But Veronica, if if the Fed is data dependent, why does it keep using the word methodical? <laughs> yeah, that's a that's a good question. Um, I think they they still want to be predictable in in their policy, or at least they don't want to surprise the market. Um, maybe it's more you know important to to look at the the methodical you know choice of of words and just in respect to to what the market is pricing. Um, if the market is is pricing a more aggressive Fed, I think they'll see that as as methodical and they'll they'll meet that expectation.